old stories of Chiss military power echoing through his mind. As far as he had been able to ascertain, that whole culture and society had been lost from Republic knowledge for centuries, maybe even millennia. Now, suddenly, they'd re-entered history. Welcome back to part 4 of The Complete Life of Thrawn. Putting every canon source in chronological order, we'll see Thrawn face the greatest threat in the chaos, and make contact with the Republic and later Empire, embarking on the grand mission that would consume the rest of his life. Despite helping prevent the civil war engineered by Haplif, the Grisk remained a threat to the Ascendancy. After the Hoxham incident, Thrawn aimed to uncover information about the party responsible for hiring the Watith crew led by Fasir. Observing artistic patterns on the salt barrel, Thrawn directed the Spring Hawk to the Zizek system, a trading hub southeast of the Ascendancy, where he suspected Fasir's men had been recruited. In the language Minisaya, Thrawn announced his intention to return the 23 Watith prisoners to the Watith present in the system. However, Fasir's crew had all perished, a fact not disclosed during the announcement. Thrawn kept the Springhawk's trip to the Zizek system a secret from the rest of the Ascendancy, heading directly to the system without stopping for repairs at Scylla. He explained to his bridge officers that their presence in the system was to elicit a reaction that could help uncover the true threat behind the Watith crew. And arriving at Zizek, Thrawn instructed his officers to thoroughly catalog all the ships and their possessions in the system. Here, the Springhawk encountered Nekari, a member of the Kilji species and the leader of the Kilji government known as the Kilji Illumin. Unbeknownst to Thrawn, the Grisk agent Jixtus was on Nikari's flagship, a war cruiser called Whetstone, where he was advising the General Lirius and effectively turning the Kill Horde, the military for the Illumin, into a client military for the Grisk hegemony. Thrawn engaged Nekari in conversation about the Kilji Path, ancient Chiss philosophy, and the Watith, a conversation that nearly ended in confrontation between the Whetstone and the Springhawk. But the Zizek system defense forces managed to prevent bloodshed. Nevertheless, Thrawn gained valuable insights from the Kilji's response to the discussion, specifically on the Watith, and the Springhawk's officers completed a comprehensive catalog of all starships there. After gathering information about the Kilji, Thrawn set course for the planet Sposia to deliver an artifact from the Salt Barrel, a lattice system that allowed the Watith crew to detect approaching vessels emerging from hyperspace. Thrawn and Simacro handed over the artifact to the Universal Analysis Group, UAG, and prior to this, Thrawn had already provided the UAG with a gravity well projector from the Vagari pirate operations, and what was called the Republic Energy Shield, actually obtained from the Separatists based on Mokiv. Although the UAG had not managed to reverse engineer these devices, Thrawn's reputation had grown in the upper ranks of the Ascendancy for acquiring valuable alien technology relevant to the Chiss Defense Force. At the UAG's Vault 4 on Sposia, Thrawn and Simacro delivered the Watith Lattice Artifact, where they met with Stibla Patriarch Stibla Mai Ovodo, or Lamayov, and Supreme General Bakif. They discussed the artifact's potential for defense operations. Subsequently, the Springhawk received orders to return to Scylla for repairs and a debriefing with Bakif regarding the events at Hoxon. At Scylla, Bakif conducted debriefings with Thalius, Simacro, and Thrawn, realizing that the Springhawk's crew might possess more information than others involved in the events. The Supreme General was frustrated when both Simacro and Thrawn refused to reveal all the details they knew about the Battle of the Three Families. After three days of briefings, Bakif traveled to Scylla's Blue Dock 1, where the Springhawk was undergoing repairs. Upon the ship, he would meet Simacro and Thrawn, and Bakif sought to learn the information Thrawn was intended to share with the UAG Vault and Sposia. To his dismay, Bakif discovered that the Magis was being held in hibernation on the Chiss cruiser. Although Thrawn and Simacro cited humanitarian efforts and Chiss defense protocol as justifications, Bakif was deeply troubled by the presence of a non-Chiss in a secure defense facility like the Blue Dock. He also thought that Simacro disapproved of the decision, and there was concern that Thrawn had not consulted Simacro before bringing the Magis aboard. Bakif was worried about the potential political repercussions if the Syndicure or the Council learned of this alien on board. After composing himself, Bakif inquired about who else knew of the Magis' presence on the Springhawk. While Simacro and Bakif worried about the political implications, Thrawn seemed oblivious. He stated that apart from those present, only caregiver Thalius and senior captain Lakinda, now of the Arizi family and named Arizi Indaro or Zinda, these were the only ones aware of the situation. Bakif and Simacro hoped that Zinda's loyalty to the expansionary defense fleet would outweigh her loyalty to the Arizi family the ever staunch rivals to Thrawn's myth family. Bakif then probed whether Thrawn believed Sunrise, the Magis' homeworld, held the key to the mysterious events in the Ascendancy. 
Tuan expressed reservations about Sunrise being the sole cause, but confirmed its involvement in the Agbi's plot to incite a civil war among the Chiss. While Bakif understood the gravity of the situation, he had hoped for solid evidence to justify Thrawn's actions, including imprisoning the Magis. Ideally, such evidence would tie Sunrise to the Magis, Agboi, General Yiv, and the Patatus, and maybe even the Vagari pirates, garnering support from the Syndicure for a combat mission to the planet to both return the Magis and confront this unknown enemy. Bakif and Supreme Admiral Jafas covertly sent Admiral Aralani and the Vigilant on a reconnaissance mission to investigate the remains of Nikardun bases in the area. Aralani discovered that the Nikardun had unknowingly served this unknown force, later revealed to be the Grisk hegemony. Bakif believed that if it had not been for the commotion caused by the Hawksim skirmish, the Syndicure might have punished him and Jafask for authorizing the reconnaissance. Due to these concerns, Bakif opposed Thrawn's plan to take the Maggie's aboard the Springhawk all the way to Sunrise. He considered having Thrawn return her to Rapak, either aboard the Springhawk or via a scout ship, but had not made the final decision. Thrawn requested permission to bring Shari along with the Maggie's if he were to use a scout ship for the return to Rapak. However, Bakif firmly refused, recalling the previous backlash when Thrawn took Shuri on an adventure. Samakra argued that the plan would only work if they brought the Maggies aboard the Springhawk, even if it came with career-threatening repercussions. Luckily, Bakif agreed and ordered Thrawn to take the Maggies back to her people on her pack using the Springhawk, followed by an immediate return to Naporar for further orders. He added that the Pakian governance owed the Ascendancy a favor for bringing the Maggies to see Sunrise's condition. Thrawn and Simacro were hesitant about relying on the Pakash's ability to handle the unknown enemy on Sunrise, but understood their orders. They prepared the Springhawk for their journey to Rapak. After dismissing Thrawn, Bakif questioned Simacro about the Chiss family composition of the Springhawk's crew. He specifically asked how many myth, apart from Thrawn, served aboard this cruiser. Simacro immediately provided this information, having suspected Patriarch Thuraki of protecting Thrawn before his passing. Now with Patriarch Thurfian in charge, Simacro believed the dynamics might change. They speculated about Thurfian's stance on the family members and whether he would openly oppose Thrawn, with his newfound authority as the Patriarch. During Thrawn and the Springhawks' mission to Rapak, Jixtus and Nakari traveled on the Whetstone to the orbit of Avidich. There, the Grisk agent presented a record to Patriol Thistrian, the myth Patriol of Avidich, claiming it showed a military alliance forming between the ruling Dasklo family and other Chis families. The recording displayed ships with the markings of the Aragol and Zodlak families engaging in what appeared to be a joint military exercise supervised by the Dasklo. This dream informed Patriarch Thurfian of this development, suggesting that the Gris provided this clip to act as an information broker, seeking to offer more information on the myth. The original recording was unclear about the identities of the allied families. But this dream obtained an enhanced clip that revealed the Aragal and Zodlak family's involvement, and while the Dasklo and Aragal been allies for some time, the inclusion of the Zodlak in this apparent alliance concerned Thurfian. He declined Jixtus' offer for further information and military assistance, dismissing the possibility of the Dasklo aligning with the other great families as mere speculation. He attributed any potential crisis in the Ascendancy to people like Senior Captain Thrawn. After the myth declined Jixtus' offer, the Grisk used the myth's reaction as a baseline to gauge the other family's interest in his information and their want for military support. Jixtus had gained knowledge of the rivalries among the Chiss families from Haplif, including the animosity between the Daskalo and Klar families. He instructed Nakiri to travel to Rygar to make the same offer to Patriarch Rivlex of the Klar family, claiming that they were in danger from the other Chiss families. As events unfolded, a crisis brewed in the Ascendancy while Thrawn and the Springhawk fulfilled their duties in the Chaos. After numerous encounters with Grisk forces, inter-family battles, and escalating tensions, Senior Captain Thrawn formed an alliance with various Chiss officers, including Admiral Aralani, Senior Captain Zinda, Mid-Captain Apros, as well as many others that supported him. Their goal was to confront the immense threat posed by the Jixtus fleet of Grisks. The united Chiss force gathered in the Sunrise system, strategically spreading debris and ship wreckage while powering down most systems. Soon after, the Grisk leader arrived aboard the Whetstone, accompanied by Quillori and General Irius Nekiri. Witnessing the aftermath of the assembled Chiss forces, it seemed as though Thrawn had suffered a decisive defeat, setting the stage for the fall of the Ascendancy at the hand of the Grisks. Jixtus ordered the Kilji vassals to approach the debris, but they hesitated until Nekiri confirmed their order. Despite the apparent catastrophe, Jixtus expected Thrawn to resist surrendering, which he did. The Grisk observed a skirmish between the two ships, the Vigilant and the Alos, and Jixtus ordered the vassals to move closer and broadcast a signal calling for survivors. 
Thrawn's voice responded to the calm, acknowledging that the Maggies and Magicines had been found and were aboard his ship. Jyxtus claimed that Thrawn had lost the battle, but Thrawn insisted that he was ready to face him alone. Jyxtus tried to justify his actions as compassionate by suggesting it would be beneficial to ease the suffering of the survivors. Thrawn reiterated to Jyxtus that he couldn't hand over the young and weak Magis and Magicine, but the enemy claimed that he could take care of them and treat them as honored guests. But Thrawn argued that the Grisks lacked the time and patience required for their proper training. Jyxtus, however, boasted about engineering General Yiv's campaigns and training his forces, and Thrawn countered that the Nikardun required no guidance as they simply attacked indiscriminately. Jyxtus mocked Thrawn's perception, asserting that their own actions were carefully planned to encircle the Ascendancy, and their aggressions targeted certain nations while intimidating others. Conversation touched on the conquest of the Vak Combine and the Garwian Unity, with Jyxtus claiming that they didn't need to conquer them, but rather break them from within. Thrawn inquired about the Agbui's next target, and Jyxtus mentioned the possibility of targeting the Pachians, Vax, and Garwians. Thrawn warned against attacking the Garwians and Vax, acknowledging Jyxtus's strategy for intimidation. And Jyxtus agreed that Sunrise had been a costly exercise, and considered enslaving the Garwians and Vax instead. Jyxtus introduced his fleet to Thrawn, including various warships, and Thrawn questioned if it was his entire fleet, but he confirmed it was, while hinting at a much larger Grisk fleet that would cover Scylla's sky. Thrawn then explained why sending the Nikardun against the Patatus was a mistake, leading to the destruction of the Kill Horde. Nekarui was indignant after he was shot by Jyxtus, and Thrawn urged Jyxtus to consider the weakness of the Grisk fleet and to offer a final suggestion, to surrender. The bridges of all Chiss ships, including the Whetstone, fell into silence. Quilori gazed at the empty command chair on the Whetstone, realizing that Jyxtus had abandoned him and was able to get away in an escape pod to his flagship, the Fate Spinner. On the Springhawk's bridge, Simacro warned the crew about the upcoming battle, and Thrawn commanded the Springhawk to open fire on the Armageddon, also known as the Pachyon IV. While the Springhawk's attack on the Armageddon drew the attention of one of Jyxtus' stone crushers, which had been targeting a Pachyon gunboat. As the Armageddon fired back at the Springhawk, it also launched salvos of Dibblers at the Pachyon gunboat, prompting a counterattack. Although a Dibbler intercepted a plasma sphere fired by Afria, no damage was inflicted on either side due to the distance between them. However, the Springhawk's laser fire successfully struck the Grisk's warship's hull, destroying its missiles. Thrawn praised his forces and ordered the secondary batteries to engage the enemy while directing the primary weapons to target the Armageddon. He declared that it was time to put an end to the Grisk threat. Thrawn sent Rosku and her light cruiser to join Bakif's reinforcements in attacking one of the Grisk's stone crushers. They targeted vulnerable spots previously marked by Thrawn and Erolani. Meanwhile, Zinda, the Parala, and Bokria disengaged from their attacks and headed in different directions. The Grey Shrike, commanded by Rosku, advanced through the forward point defense laser fire, targeting the starboard flank of the enemy and dropping breachers and plasma spheres onto its hull. After a final volley on the port side barrage, the Grey Shrike veered toward deep space. Despite receiving heavy damage, the Grey Shrike also suffered casualties during the encounter. Gluxku informed Zinda about these losses while the enemy moved towards the wounded Night Hunter, intending to destroy it. Thrawn, however, had foreseen this outcome and had a plan for it. As the Grey Shrike attempted to escape to hyperspace by reaching the planet's gravity well, the Emery pursued the heavy cruiser to eliminate it, and Thrawn ordered the Grey Shrike to perform an in system jump while activating the gravity field. The Grisk warship tried to pursue through hyperspace, but the Vagari gravity well generator prevented it from doing so. Zinda instructed Zimsk to mark the edge of the gravity field, ordering Wakiv to calculate another in system jump. When executed, the Grey Shrike appeared next to the Emery and destroyed the latter in a dazzling explosion. Thrawn speculated that the Jyxtus was ready to fight, when the Fate Spinner, which had been inactive for most of the battle, now headed towards the Vigilant and the Alos. He told Erolani that Jyxtus had to be damaged enough to be threatened, but not enough to force a retreat, as the next battle might occur in the center of the Ascendancy. The Vigilant, Alos, and the Stingfly locked their tractors on an asteroid, engaging in fire and sphere exchanges with the Fate Spinner. When the Grisk warship destroyed the asteroid, hidden breachers in its shadows were revealed. These impacted the warship, and the Chiss expected Jyxtus to retreat, but he surprised them by launching missiles and attacking their warship before escaping to the planet below. Jyxtus contacted Whetstone, threatening to destroy it and everyone inside, and questioned Quilori about how the Chiss achieved their jumps and deactivated the Grisk ship's hyperdrives. Although Quilori didn't know for sure, he did have some suspicions. But in the meantime, one battle chief exploded, and Jyxtus attempted to destroy the gunboat carrying the Vigari device. Rosku sent her vector to Aralani, who ordered her ship to move towards it. As the Springhawk moved towards a pair of injured battle chiefs fighting the Pachyon gunboats and patrol cruisers, the Grey Shrike, Orison, and Springhawk prepared to attack the Armageddon. 
Thrawn instructed all ships to lock breachers onto the massive warship, creating a cloud that the Armageddon drove into. The smaller ships attacked the large warship, and Thrawn ordered the Grey Shrike to assist Aprosis Gumbo, which was now being targeted by two Grisk battle chiefs, hoping to take out the Gravity Well Generator. But to no avail. Realizing that there was no escape, Jixtus flipped a kill switch, which destroyed all of his vassals, and gave a final cold warning to Thrawn that though he defeated him, the Grisk would return promising to finally destroy the Ascendancy once and for all. Seconds later, Jixtus would activate the kill switch on his own ship, finally destroying this latest of threats and preventing a civil war within the Ascendancy. But even after this victory, Thrawn's disregard for politics finally caught up to him. There had been simply too many breaches of protocol, too many important families manipulated by this alien threat, embarrassed on a political stage like never before, prompting the order to have Thrawn exiled to lesser space on orders of the Defense Hierarchy Council. Or at least, that was the official story. This public exile served to both save face and allow Thrawn to embark on his most important mission yet, one which would require him to go deep undercover. In his time exploring the galaxy's outer rim, he had come across a group of displaced Nymordian refugees shortly after the Galactic Empire's establishment, so sometime around 19 BBY. The colonists informed him about the Empire's oppressive rule and implored him to lead the Chiss Ascendancy in an all-out assault on the Empire's stronghold on Coruscant. They even offered to aid in the attack if it meant restoring the Galactic Republic. Although Thrawn was skeptical of the Nymordians' unverified claims, he dutifully reported this encounter to his Chiss superiors. The higher-ups in the Chiss Ascendancy expressed concern over this report. Perhaps the Empire could be an ally against the Grisks. Thrawn was assigned a mission and had to either forge an alliance with the Empire or weaken it enough to divert attention from the Ascendancy, making it so the Grisk would go for Coruscant and not Scylla. Despite foiling Jixtus' scheme, Thrawn noticed continuing political conflicts among the Aristocras, though he always assumed that they would eventually settle their disputes as they had done in the past. Following the successful defeat of the Grisk fleet at Sunrise, some in the Aristocra sought to place blame on others. But Thrawn worked out a plan with Supreme General Bakif and Supreme General Jafosk. They decided that Thrawn would publicly take the blame, be stripped of his rank, and go into exile. During this show exile, Thrawn began his mission to meet with the Empire and assess its usefulness. With the assistance of the Ascendancy's Defense Hierarchy Council, he set up a convincing facade on a planet in wild space to attract the Empire's attention. After several attempts and a few standard months, Thrawn successfully managed to catch the Empire's eye. Originally, Thrawn had planned for a relatively short absence, intending to make contact with high-ranking officials like Anakin Skywalker, gather intel on the Empire, and then return to the Ascendancy. However, he did not anticipate the possibility of being offered a chance to join the Imperial military. Before departing, Supreme General Bakif expressed regret that Thrawn would never become an admiral in the Empire. Thrawn acknowledged that such an opportunity was unlikely, as his own ascendancy wouldn't promote him to that rank. He enjoyed one final meal aboard the Parala, commanded by Senior Captain Apros, and declined Bakif's invitation to share this meal, preferring to dine alone at a bistro with sentimental value, which he often shared with his late brother Thras. In approximately 15 BBY, Thrawn experienced a momentous encounter with the Galactic Empire. While away from his camp, the Imperial Venator-class Star Destroyer Strike Fast, under the command of Captain Voss Park, arrived at the planet on a mission to apprehend smugglers. Captain Park, Colonel Mosh Barris, and Cadet Eli Vanto inspected Thrawn's encampment, closely examining the Cybisti markings on the crates in accordance with the Imperial Unknown Alien Protocols. These were known as UA Protocols, and were a set of laws inherited from the former Galactic Republic, mandating Imperial forces to investigate any potential instances of first contact with an unknown alien species. Cadet Vanto, a senior at the Empire's Myamar Academy in the expansion region of the galaxy, possessed fluency in Cybisti as it was the trade language commonly used near his homeworld, Lysatra, in wild space. While the Imperial team conducted their search, Thrawn ingeniously used a precisely placed monofilament line to cause a surveying V-Wing to crash. Managing to extract the pilot's body armor from the flight suit, he proceeded to seize the pilot's blaster, power packs, comlink, and concussion grenades. Thrawn then filled the flight suit with grass, leaves, and fermented purish berries, effectively creating a makeshift scarecrow, all while leaving the crash site undetected before Major Wyan arrived to investigate. By the time Wyan presented the stuffed flight suit to Captain Park, Thrawn set and planned his motion to board the Strike Fast. 
Concealing himself along the edge of the encampment, Thrun detached the storm dowels from a stolen blaster packs and fastened them to the backs of small nocturnal creatures. Attracted by the scent of the fermented berries in the makeshift scarecrow, the creatures instinctively ran into the Imperial encampment, resulting in explosions and widespread confusion within the base. In response, Captain Park issued orders for another group of viewings to conduct a grid search to find the yet unidentified perpetrator. In recognizing the need to replace his stolen comm before it was jammed, Thrawn skillfully caused the crash of another V-Wing, and then took this pilot's comm. He again took the blaster, power packs, and grenades, but this time left the pilot's body in the flight suit. Amidst this turmoil faced by Imperial forces, Colonel Barris deployed Imperial Navy troopers to aid in the search. These troopers wore distinguishable black helmets that revealed their faces, unlike Imperial Stormtroopers. And as a Chiss with blue skin and red eyes, he needed a more suitable disguise to infiltrate the human-dominated Galactic Empire. He strategically launched explosive attacks against the Navy troopers throughout the night, hoping to provoke the Imperials into sending Stormtroopers to investigate the forest. When Stormtroopers were dispatched to find Thrawn, he employed another explosive to neutralize one of them and study the Stormtroopers' armor, simultaneously jamming the Imperial comms in order to mask the explosion's sound. Subsequently, Thrawn donned the Phase II Clone Trooper armor taken from the incapacitated trooper. After the commotion from the comms died down, Barris decided he had endured enough of Thrawn's attacks, and he wanted the mysterious attacker's entire hut transported on board the strike fast for further examination. He justified his actions by citing that UA protocols did not explicitly demand the studies to occur at location, they could just take this potential first contact site with them. And sensing it was time to return to his camp, Thrawn silently eliminated another stormtrooper, filling his armor with explosives, before placing it in the encampment, propping it up with sticks besides the transport. And while the Imperials were distracted by this exploding armor, Thrawn concealed himself inside a power-generating casing from his camp. The casing was then loaded onto a transport along with the rest of Thrawn's hut and crates, all bound for the strike fest, while Thrawn was still in that clone trooper armor. Thrawn lingered for about two standard hours as he navigated across the hangar and entered a Zeta-class heavy cargo shuttle. When detected, Park dispatched troopers to confront him, and Thrawn offered no resistance, letting himself be detained. Once in custody, he was presented to Park and Barris, and recognizing the communication barrier, they enlisted Cadet Vanto, adept inside Bisti, to translate. Amongst them, only Vanto identified Thrawn as a Chiss, recounting the Chiss tales he'd grown up hearing on Lysatra. Upon hearing the term Chiss from Vanto, Thrawn's interest peaked, curious about what the cadet knew of his kind. Thrawn said that while he had a grasp of basic, he was more proficient in Cybisti. Park, however, insisted on talking in basic for clarity. Throughout their exchange, aided by Vanto's translations, Thrawn introduced himself by his full name, Mithron Narodo, but suggested Thrawn for simplicity. He enlightened them about his exile, his calculated actions leading to his capture, and his need to return to his people facing unspecified perils. When Park probed why Thrawn was exiled despite his people's need for him, Thrawn hinted at a disagreement on a concept which he expressed in Cybisti as Ezbuli Huslalu, which Vanto nervously translated as preemptive strikes. This discussion left a lasting impression on Park, leading him to decide that Emperor Palpatine should meet Thrawn personally. He was then allocated a temporary residence aboard the Strike Fast, and after a meeting with Park and Vanto, they concluded that due to the cadet's unique insights into the Chiss and proficiency in Cybisti, he would act as Thrawn's interpreter and mentor in Galactic Basic for the trip's duration to Coruscant, a responsibility which Vanto accepted despite his reservations. Thrawn spent all of his time in the company of Vanto, and besides studying Basic, Vanto shared legends about the Chiss that he had heard while growing up. Thrawn found these legends intriguing and informative, but also noticed some inaccuracies and tons of exaggerations. They delved into discussions about the Empire, particularly its social hierarchies and prejudices against aliens and even humans from outside the Core Worlds. Vanto revealed his career goal of becoming a supply officer in the Imperial Navy. Initially curious about human legends of the Chiss, Thrawn soon recognized Vanto's untapped talent in tactical and analytical abilities and saw a potential in making him his protege. Upon reaching Coruscant, Thrawn, Vanto, Barris, Park, and several Navy troopers and stormtroopers boarded a Lambda-class T-4A shuttle and headed to the Imperial Palace. Although aware of the significance of the meeting with the Emperor, Thrawn did not seem daunted but appeared remarkably self-assured, which Vanto took note of. Trying to ease his own nerves, Vanto convinced himself that they would only meet palace officials, which turned out to be incorrect. Escorted by two of Palpatine's personal royal guardsmen in red robes, Thrawn and the Imperials arrived at the Emperor's throne room. Park presented Thrawn as a gift to Palpatine, but Thrawn corrected the notion, presenting himself as a resource. 
he informed the Emperor about the mysterious threat in the unknown regions that his native Chiss ascendancy had discovered and offered this information in exchange for the Empire's assistance. To establish trust, Thrawn mentioned Skywalker as someone who could vouch for him, believing Skywalker to be in the Emperor's service. However, Palpatine revealed that Skywalker had died, though he noted that he had spoken highly of Thrawn before his demise. The Emperor accepted Thrawn's offer for information and proposed a role in the Imperial Navy as a reward. Thrawn agreed, requesting to keep Vanto as his translator. Palpatine led Thrawn to the privacy of the throne room's interior garden to further discuss the threat in the unknown regions. Thrawn admired the artistic intricacy of the garden, which he interpreted as a symbol of power, subtlety, and profound thought. During this conversation, they explored Palpatine's personal interest in the mysteries of the Unknown Regions, and the Emperor could tell that Thrawn did not need a translator, but Thrawn insisted on keeping Vanto as his personal attaché. Secretly, Thrawn aimed to nurture Vanto's talents as a tactician and strategist, having an ally in the Empire that he built from the ground up. The Emperor granted Thrawn's request, arranging for him to undergo three months of training at Coruscant's Royal Imperial Academy with Vanto by his side. This duration coincided with the remainder of Vanto's cadet term at Myanmar Academy, and although the Academy on Coruscant was far more prestigious, Vanto still felt some resentment at being reassigned without being asked. Upon their arrival at the Academy, Thrawn and Vanto made their way to the office of Commandant Dean Lark, the Academy's highest ranking official. Thrawn faced hostility, as the man openly displayed disdain for the alien, and was outraged that he was sent to his office by the Emperor's command. Thrawn was informed that he would not graduate as an ensign like Vanto, but instead with the rank of Lieutenant. Dean Lark secretly hoped this higher rank would make Thrawn a target for bullying, prompting Thrawn to study the social hierarchy within the Academy. Because of Vanto's advice, Thrawn chose not to wear his rank plaque immediately, opting to disguise himself as a regular cadet. During their time at the Academy, Thrawn and Vanto resided in barracks too. The cadets underwent training in hand-to-hand -hand combat, Imperial procedures and technology, equipment, and tactics. Throughout their term at the Royal Imperial Academy, there were many incidents of bullying and harassment that were difficult to address due to various reasons. They can never find out exactly who did it or what their intent was. They were all craftily disguised as accidents, or when it was direct, the other cadets made sure it didn't get so bad to require disciplinary action. Thrawn never responded with violence, believing that it would only push them further and could get them all in trouble. This hypothesis was proven correct one month into their three-month term, when cadets Spank Orbar and Rosita Turi invited them to play a card game called Highland Challenge in the Metallurgy Lab. Thrawn was aware that it was a trap meant to catch him gambling and trespassing in the lab, but he decided to accept the offer, confident in his ability to turn the situation to his favor. As they arrived in the lab at the designated time, Thrawn and Vanto declined Orbar and Turi's proposal to play for credits. Although Turi was displeased, they proceeded with the game. During the round, Thrawn skillfully discussed the concept of traps in the context of the card game. As the bully's trap was sprung when Orbar discreetly alerted an instructor, Thrawn quickly put on his lieutenant's rank plaque. The instructor, unable to punish a lieutenant for being in the lab, reluctantly allowed Thrawn and Vanto to leave, much to Orbar and Turi's frustration. Instead of seeking punishment for them, Lieutenant Thrawn informed the instructor that the cadets were conducting a metallurgical test and that he and Vanto were merely observing the process. After the instructor left, Thrawn conveyed to the embarrassed Rosita and Speck that there was no guaranteed winning hand, using it as a metaphor for both Highland Challenge and life in the military. Thrawn and Vanto made their way back to their barracks, and Vanto expressed his admiration for Thrawn's skill in subverting the trap with such precise timing. A moment later, he swiftly pushed Vanto into the bushes as he was attacked by Grim and two other cadets that had been called to the scene by Orbar and Turi. Thrawn engaged the assailants, allowing them to land a few hits to assess their combat skills. With the help of a distraction from Vanto, Thrawn managed to injure one of them, causing all three to disperse. After the attackers fled, Thrawn and Vanto returned to Dean Lark's office to report the incident. Thrawn deduced that the attack had been orchestrated by Orbar and Turi and informed his superior that the attackers were likely associates of the other two cadets. When Dean Lark argued that he couldn't punish the cadets due to them having influential parents, Thrawn proposed an alternative. He suggested transferring Gim and the assailants to Sky Strike Academy for fighter pilot training, recognizing their tactics were actually well suited to TIE fighters. Thrawn explained that this punishment would create a sense of paranoia among the guilty cadets and fear among Orbar and Turi, making sure they thought twice about their own actions. And despite his hatred for aliens, Dean Lark agreed that this was a good plan. Two months later, Thrawn graduated from the Royal Imperial Academy as lieutenant, and on the day of his graduation, he received a second rank insignia plaque, which he kept for future use. After the ceremony, Thrawn briefly met Eli Vanto's parents, who appeared uneasy around him. 
The Vantos mentioned their wish to use their beck and call, a technology that intrigued Thrawn, able to recall their ship with a push of a button. Following their departure, Thrawn and Vanto reported to Dean Lark's office for their first career assignments. Thrawn was assigned as the second weapons officer on the Gazanti-class cruiser, Blood Crow, and Vanto was his aide. While it was not common for lieutenants to have aides, Thrawn received this special assignment, and as they boarded the Gazanti, they began their careers in the Imperial Navy. During the initial 18 months in his tenure among the Blood Crow, Thrawn served alongside Captain Rick Virgilio, engaging in activities such as hunting smugglers, assisting distressed ships, and resolving political conflicts in the Mid and Outer Rims. Thrawn cherished his time under Virgilio's command, experiencing minimal discrimination and rapidly advancing to the position of First Weapons Officer. Additionally, Virgilio granted Thrawn's access to the unused Number 2 storage bay on the Blood Crow, where he stored a collection of Clone Wars era technology that he was reassembling. Thrawn's purpose was to study the era and its warfare, leading him to acquire two dunium shelled Mark I buzz droids, a droidica, and half of a single trooper aerial platform, and most of a hyperdrive ring over these 18 months. But this relatively peaceful post was disrupted when Captain Filia Rossi unexpectedly replaced Virgilio without any explanation. Rossi had previously served as first officer of an ore freighter, and from the moment she arrived on the Blood Crow, Thrawn found himself in conflict with her. During a ship survey conducted by First Officer Senior Lieutenant Nels Dayland, Rossi discovered Thrawn's collection of Clone Wars technology. She demanded a meeting with him and Dayland in the storage bay, aimed at asserting her authority as captain. She insisted that the collection be discarded or destroyed. Defending these pieces, Thrawn argued that he had acquired these pieces with his own credits, and with Dayland's assistance, Thrawn managed to negotiate a compromise. Captain Rossi agreed to let him retain his collection until they reached Ancyon, during which time he could attempt to repair the buzz droids to increase their market value. Afterward, the collection would be handed over to her for sale. Thrawn agreed to the compromise, keeping the fact that the buzz droids were already fully operational a secret. Under Rossi's command, Thrawn faced significantly more challenges compared to his time under Virgilio, both being prejudiced against aliens and displeased with this odd fact that Thrawn had an aide. Every unpleasant and undesirable task aboard the Blood Crow was assigned to Thrawn. And it was because of this that it was no surprise to Thrawn and Vanto when they were assigned to investigate a distress call from the cargo freighter Dromedar. The freighter carried a valuable cargo of static lock Tabana gas, a locking mechanism notorious for generating copious amounts of dirt and dust. Upon reaching the stranded Dromedar, Thrawn led a boarding party to the vessel, consisting of Vanto, Ensign Mary Balrin, electronics technician Lanio, and engineering technician Jaquib. Thrawn divided the group, sending Vanto, Lanio, and Jaquib to investigate the engine section while he and Barlin made their way to the bridge. After a few minutes, Vanto signaled Thrawn, informing him that he had found someone in the central passageway. Thrawn told Vanto to bring this person back to the bridge. Thrawn first encountered a man that would later be known as Night Swan, operating under the alias Neville Signy. Thrawn inquired about the threats made to his men, to which Night Swan explained that he mistook them for pirates, revealing that the Dromadar had been attacked by pirates who took the crew hostage and planned to steal the Tabana gas. They had left to get a slicer to restart the Dromadar's hyperdrive, and evaluating the situation, he ordered Vanto to contact Rossi and request a full operational team to either restart the hyperdrive or transfer the Tabana gas canisters to the Blood Crow. Although Vanto was concerned about her reaction, Thrawn stood firm in his decision, and once Vanto left to convey the message, he began his thorough examination of the ship. As anticipated, Rossi did not approve the request of a full team. Instead, Thrawn received the necessary supplies and up to three additional crew members, apart from Vanto and himself, to handle this situation. The Blood Crow had been called to Maltok to address a Makruth boss's attack on a Hoden settlement, leaving Thrawn content with remaining on the Dromadar with Vanto, Barlin, Laneo, and Jaquib as the Blood Crow headed to Moltok. While Barlin and Laneo worked on finding an asymmetric backdoor code to restart the Dromadar on its bridge, Thrawn, Vanto, and Night Swan moved to the cargo bay. Thrawn unveiled one of his Mark I buzz droids from his supply crates taken from the Blood Crow. He planned to use the buzz droids to cut through the hole and release the static lock Tabana canisters from outside the ship. Night Swan was impressed with the plan, surprised that he hadn't thought of it himself or seen it used more frequently. Thrawn admitted that it required sacrificing one of the Tabana canisters, which is something many were unwilling to make. But this was all unnecessary when Barlin and Laneo managed to repair the hyperdrive. As Thrawn turned to face Night Swan, he was looking down the barrel of a blaster. The man intended to take control of the Dromadar and requested that Thrawn order Barlin, Laneo, Jaquib, and Vanto to all surrender to avoid bloodshed. Before Thrawn could respond, they were all surrounded by Angel and his Carlos pirate crew. Night Swan offered him another chance to surrender, and he complied, instructing the others to do the same via comlink. 
They were all taken to the Angel's ship, the Marauder, alongside the Dromedar's crew. Night Swan demanded that Thrawn and the prisoners be left unharmed at the designated rendezvous, as his interest was solely in the Tabana and the ship. Although Angel wanted to kill Thrawn, he reluctantly agreed to the arrangement and locked up the Imperials with the Dromedar crew. Once inside the cell, Thrawn quietly waited until Night Swan and Angel reboarded the Dromedar and jumped the light speed. Seizing the opportunity, he jumped right into his plan, asking Lenio if she could isolate the bridge and operate the Marauder from the control panel in the room, to which she confirmed as long as she could reach the panel. Thrawn then used his beck and call, made from a spare insignia plaque, to summon the buzz droid. With the little droid's help, Thrawn disabled the cell's locking mechanism, and when the three pirates entered the lockup, Thrawn guided the buzz droid to attack them, while Jaki broke apart the damaged cell door. Thrawn and the others overpowered the pirates, and he directed the second buzz droid to cut the ship in half to avoid confronting the others in the forward section. The emergency airlock sealed the sections to prevent decompression. With Lyneo controlling the remaining part of the ship, Thrawn assumed the command of the Marauder, with the Dromedar's captain, Fitz, inquiring about their next course of action. Upon returning to Blood Crow, Thrawn and Vanto faced Rossi to explain everything, revealing that he had suspected Night Swan's betrayal, willfully allowing himself to be captured to locate and rescue the Dromedar's crew. However, Rossi was displeased, valuing the Tabana gas over the lives saved. In her eyes, Thrawn's actions failed to meet the standards of the Imperial High Command. As punishment, she sentenced him to suspension at Admiral Plor Wiscoviz's base on Ancien, while awaiting an official ruling from Coruscant. In recognizing an opportunity to reclaim the Dromedar, Thrawn subtly manipulated Rossi into suspending Vanto along with him. Due to these actions on Ancyon, they managed to find and recover the Dromedar and its Tabana canisters, but Night Swan evaded capture. After inspecting the canisters, it was discovered that Night Swan had covertly stolen the contents of 12 of the 20 canisters using a variation of Thrawn's suggested technique on the Dromedar. This partial defeat greatly frustrated Thrawn and ignited his obsession and rivalry with Night Swan. On Ancien, Thrawn persuaded Admiral Wiscovis to permit him to interrogate the three captured pirates, with Vanto as a witness. Thrawn correctly deduced that the pirates, calling themselves Kulos, were remnants from the Kahana Marauders, a crew led by the pirate queen Kuana, who had been killed by Grand Moff Will of Tarkin and the Outland Region Security Force. Threatening the pirates with a visit from Tarkin, Thrawn struck a deal with them. In exchange for the location of Night Swan, Angel, and the Dromedar, Thrawn offered the pirates safe transport out of the sector before Tarkin and the ISB showed up, bringing their enhanced interrogation torture devices. The pirates conversed in Cybisti, believing no Imperial officers would understand, and planned to give false information to deceive Thrawn. Switching back to Basic, and saying that the Dromedar had been taken to Karthlistun on Ketum, Though, of course, Thrawn and Vanto knew they were lying. But nevertheless, Thrawn wanted to know why they would want to lead them to Cartherston, suspecting to flip whatever trap might be there. After leaving the interrogation room, Thrawn, Vanto, and Wiscovis deciphered the pirates' slang words Trapo, Obdub, and Squalish to conclude that the Dromedar had been taken to a trading post on the planet Uba and the Barsa Sector. Hoping to shield Wiscovis from the potential career repercussions, Thrawn volunteered to take full responsibility for the operation to Uba in this unlikely rescue of the Dromedar. Thrawn and Wiscovis dispatched forces to Uba and Ketum to arrest the pirates and reclaim the Tabana gas. Suspecting that the stolen Tabana might be transported to the nearby Tabana-producing planet Krill Dor, Thrawn had also ordered forces to be sent there. By covering all three locations, this operation was a strategic success, but still, Thrawn found himself facing the possibility of a court-martial from High Command due to the earlier disobeying of protocol and letting him and his crewmates be captured. Consequently, during Ascension Week and Empire Day on Coruscant, Thrawn, Vanto, and ISB Colonel Willa Fularen attended parties filled with influential people. Fularen supported Thrawn's actions on Ancyon, and sought to aid him during the court-martial by introducing him to senators and ministers who could be more helpful in the investigation. At one such party in the Alessandre Hotel's Grand Ballroom, Thrawn met Arinda Price, then an aide to Lothal Senator Domus Rankin. Price correctly deduced Thrawn's purpose for the party before they moved on to speak with another senator, and Thrawn and Yalaren's social strategizing eventually paid off, as the court-martial committee cleared him of all charges. However, he remained bothered by the outcome of the incident and Night Swan's cunning. Thinking of how Night Swan knew the value of the Mark I buzz droid, he asked Vanto to investigate the supply and demand of the rare metal Dunium, suspecting that the Empire was involved in secret military projects that was for some reason a suspicion shared by Night Swan. 
Following the court martial committee's decision, Thrawn received new orders from high command. He was promoted from lieutenant to captain and assigned as first officer aboard an Arquidans class light cruiser, the Thunder Wasp, with Vanto remaining as his aide. Thrawn was disappointed that Vanto was not promoted, as he had recommended him for both a rank promotion and combat promotion, but nevertheless, they both accepted their new assignments. Thrawn spent the following year under Commander Alfred Chango's guidance, chasing down smugglers and pirates in the Midrim territories. During this time, Thrawn made five trips to Coruscant, where he assisted Emperor Palpatine in mapping the unknown regions. Additionally, during each visit, Thrawn collaborated with Yularen on an investigation to uncover Night Swan's identity and activity throughout the stars. Toward the end of his first year aboard the Thunder Wasp, Thrawn observed a sudden increase in the value of vulture droids while browsing for his collection. Intrigued, he discreetly purchased another vulture droid part and took a peek at the Rodian salesman's order requests when the merchant was distracted. In the order requests, Thrawn discovered that Night Swan had bought a considerable number of vulture droid parts from the dealer, paying with the rare metal Iridium. Shortly after, Thrawn and Vanto apprehended a group of smugglers who had been concealing Iridium in the shells of Parklarn Grist Mollusks. Further investigation led Thrawn to conclude that Night Swan was behind the smuggling operation and had used the Iridium to finance large shipments of vulture droids. By extracting information from the captured smugglers, Thrawn learned that Night Swan had mentioned the planet Umbara while instructing them. Vanto dismissed Umbara as a false lead. Thrawn trusted his instincts and believed that investigating insurgent activity on Umbara was crucial. This intuition proved accurate, as there was intense insurgent activity here, leading the Thunder Wasp to be dispatched to Umbara, along with Admiral Carlisle Gendling's task force, in hopes of quelling the violence here that stemmed all the way back to the Clone Wars. Throughout the journey to Umbara, Thrawn secluded himself in his cabin, immersing himself in Umbaran art, surrounding himself with holographic depictions of different historical periods, meticulously observing the subtle differences between Republic and Imperial era art, and using these similarities and differences to draw insights into the contemporary Umbaran culture, hoping to glean insights on their military strategies. Vanto interrupted Thrawn's musings to tell him that they arrived at Umbara in Commander Cheno's request for his presence on the bridge. By the time Thrawn reached the bridge, the Thunder Wasp, along with Genling's Imperial Star Destroyer Foremost, and two Raider-class corvettes had taken their battle positions. While on the bridge, Cheno plainfully remarked to Thrawn that he hoped that the Umbarans would attack, finally bringing recognition to him and the Thunder Wasp. Thrawn, however, believed the likelihood of an Umbaran attack to be slim. On the bridge, Thrawn observed alongside Vanto and Cheno as Genling delivered his ultimatum to the Umbaran insurgents, demanding that they surrender their leaders within the hour or face the consequences. Vanto naively believed that this would solve everything. The battle erupted with a sudden appearance of 400 vulture droids emerging from behind Umbara's outmost moon. As the battle ensued and Cheno ordered a counterattack against the vulture droid, Vanto was quick to point out to Thrawn that he had been mistaken. Nevertheless, Thrawn stuck to his initial deduction, surmising that the attack did not originate from the Umbarans, and that they were merely observing, contemplating whether or not to join the conflict. As the battle persisted and the Thunder Wasps suffered increasing damage, Thrawn recognized that Cheno was incapable of effectively leading the battle, and he swiftly took command of the situation. Relocating Senior Lieutenant Hammerly to a turbolaser station, Thrawn, accompanied by Vanto, occupied Hammerly's sensor station to analyze the attack patterns of the Vulture Droids. After closely observing their movements, he deduced that their efficiency surpassed what would be expected from their pre-programmed swarm behavior. Instead, they were under direct control from a transmitting base. Understanding that the key was to uncover the location of this transmitter, he noticed that the droids occasionally reverted to their programmed swarm tactics when passing through a transmission shadow created by other objects or ships obstructing the direct line of sight to the controlling transmitter. Using the sensors, Thrawn figured out the vector and pinpointed the base's location on the surface of Umbara. Once he gathered this critical intel, Thrawn called out to Cheno, urging him to inform Gendling of the base's coordinates. However, Gendling dismissed Thrawn's deduction as mere guesswork and chose to ignore him. Realizing the necessity of a surgical strike to neutralize the droid's edge, he instructed the communications officer to signal the remaining ships to attack the vulture droids when they entered the transmission shadows. The other ships acknowledged Thrawn and promptly changed their approach. Firing on the vultures when they weren't being remotely controlled, it gave the Imperials the advantage and they quickly changed the course of the battle. When the smoke cleared, there was significant damage to the corvettes, as well as the Thunder Wasp and Foremost, and one corvette was completely destroyed, but this vulture droid wave was defeated, and the Umbaran insurgents surrendered without conditions. Vanto believed that if Genling had listened to Thrawn, the Imperial warships would have sustained far less damage. 
Despite Thrawn's successful strategy that turned the tide of a seemingly lost battle, Genling was livid with both Thrawn and Cheno for their roles in the battle. His ego wounded, Genling threatened to end Cheno's career as a consequence. However, when Genling turned his anger towards Thrawn, Cheno intervened and saved the Chiss captain's career. Privately, Cheno expressed his belief in Thrawn's potential, considering him the future of the Imperial Navy, and expressing gratitude for the opportunity to command him, even if it was just briefly. After the meeting with Genling and Cheno, Thrawn conferred with Vanto to explore the possibility of Night Swan being behind this attack. He assigned Vanto, the proficient numerical analyst, the task of examining the value of Umbaran ore and comparing the success rates of smugglers on Umbara versus those operating on worlds where the Empire controlled mining and metal supply lines. As Thrawn suspected, smugglers enjoyed far greater success on planets with Imperial controlled industries. From this data, Thrawn deduced that Night Swan had orchestrated events on Umbara to prompt the Empire's takeover of the mines, facilitating his smuggling endeavors. Furthermore, Thrawn realized that Night Swan had deliberately allowed the Iridium smugglers to be captured in order to draw the Imperials to Umbara in the first place. He was now more impressed with Night Swan than ever, acknowledging that he would have to wait for the insurgent leader to resurface before taking further action. Due to the outcome of the battle, Genling and the High Command forced Cheno into retirement. Thrawn found this decision deeply frustrating, considering it a wasteful and foolish mismanagement of valuable resources. To Thrawn's surprise, Vanto revealed that Cheno was not the first Navy career Thrawn had inadvertently destroyed, and it would not be the last. Thrawn was unsettled by this revelation, but accepted the reality of his position and his lack of control over the intricacies and culture of the Empire. Let's pause here, and in part 5 we will see the brilliant rise of Thrawn.